Good morning. Welcome to Thursday morning of the summit. Has everyone had a great morning so far? Come on now, a little bit more. Good morning. I know there's a few of you. All right. Thank you. All right, it's great to be back here this morning. We've got a full, unbelievable closing trio. Uh, but before we get to those particular panelists and keynote speakers, just want to ask, who was able to make it to a breakout session this morning? Show of hands. Wow. All right, thank you very much. I was actually able to sit in on one, and uh, I just wanted to give you a few thoughts from what I saw. This was the one on uh, sponsorship and uh, purpose-driven sponsorship activation hosted by Robin Raj with uh, Keith from BSF, Steve from the A's, and Chris from Growth Energy. And really interesting combination of understanding how difficult it is sometimes to get approval, get funding for something that's a little bit beyond the mainstream that cares about both the bottom line and what we're all here to talk about, the environment. But then also, once that started, how support grew internally and how people were able to leverage telling those stories internally and externally, show a measurable return, and that year over year it started to become a little bit easier. As we all know, it's still some, in some quarters still swimming upstream, but uh, really fascinating. And I would encourage you to reach out to any of the, those participants to get more information on that. And now we're heading into our closing plenaries. We've got three biggies for you. First, we're going to do sports addressing social equity. Then the legend, P.T. Townend. And then we're going to close it out with sports leading the way to protect our oceans. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage, oh, first we'd, a final thank you, and, and please, a round of applause for this. This is a fabulous house. We've really received great service from the Kings and Golden Ones. So please, could you all just give a round of applause for our hosts? And then, of course, we'll have a closing reception at 1.30. And our sponsors, they're too numerous to name. Hopefully, you visited them. You can see their names around. And without them, this would not be possible. So if you wouldn't mind, one more round of applause, please, for our sponsors. All right, to start us off and uh, lead us into our first keynote panel, I'd like to bring up Jen Regan, who's the President and Chief Sustainability Officer of We Bring It On, and more importantly, a board member of the Green Sports Alliance. Jen Regan, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Hello, Green Sports Changemakers. Woohoo! Thank you, Joe. My name's Jen Regan. I've been a board member for three years, and I've been a member, as many of you, I've been to all seven Green Sports Summit. So for those OGs in the house, woohoo! Um, and for those of you that are here, I'm gonna woohoo for you too, because this is an inclusive movement. The change that we're here to make in the world starts with you, and it starts with you turning to the person next to you and having a conversation you didn't even know was possible. So. All I know is I don't know what I know, but I know that I'm here to make a difference and I want to be in an open dialogue with you about what I can learn and what you can teach me and what I can teach you from my experience. And as an avid sustainability generalist, it means I believe, yeah, right? It's like, whew, I want to be involved in everything. But most importantly, I recognize sustainability has always been about social, and it's always been about environment for me, both and. And of course, profit, because we are building the economy, the society that we want to live in. So for me, it's an honor to be the chair, co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee with the Green Sports Alliance. Because it is time for us to recognize that in order to make the difference that we're here to make, everyone gets to play whatever way they play, and we get to learn from each other in creating the rules of the game because the rules of the game are changing. So the Diversity and Commu uh, Inclusion Committee, I'm so excited, I'm stumbling on words, you know that's a good sign. The Diversity and Inclusion Committee is just starting. So if you have insight, you have partners, you have organizations that have yet to join, 
bring it to my attention. I'm being supported by an amazing staff member of the Green Sports Alliance, Danya Gutierrez. Between her or me, email us, let us know. But what we're committed to is opening and broadening the conversations. Many of you work in the space and know the silos that we overcome in the workplace. We have an incredible community affairs world, and they have a great office and they do great impact. And then we have great operations and engineering. And for too long, the environment has been shoved at the operators and engineers as if it's theirs alone, but it's all of ours. And so the winners of the next season are going to be the ones that bring that story together. And we're lucky to have many of those innovators on the stage today. So last year was our first year talking about diversity and inclusion on the Green Sports Summit stage. And we talked about what are some of the difficult, challenging topics that organizations take risks at bringing forward into their priorities, but how do they choose? How do they choose what they're going to talk about? Because there are so many issues of concern to the communities where we operate. That was the conversation last year. But now we want to expand that conversation and get deeper into what is it that, we, what are we dealing with? A theme of this conference, you have to make it personal. So we have a panel where each person has a really great personal experience in this work, leading this work and looking at where they bring social into active engagement, where they create change and inclusion on a daily basis through what, how they live and how they work with the businesses they're working with. So it's a great panel. But as I said, it's making it personal. I get the personal joy of introducing the moderator. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to hear her speak, Mary V. Harvey, board member, vice chair of the Green Sports Alliance board, is the moderator. I also get to acknowledge and celebrate her for a couple more things first before I bring her up on stage. So for those of you that don't know, Mary was a goalie on the first women's World Cup team who won the title, who also won the 1996 Olympics for the Women's World Cup. She is a gold medalist. I know we have a couple other medalists in the audience, so I honor our Olympic athletes. We love you. We appreciate your service to our country. But one thing that Mary has done, and she said this to me the other day, I get a chance to work with her very closely because diversity and inclusion is something that she has fought for in many areas of her life, and she is supporting me with the development of this committee. She was telling me about the early days. We think there's a pay gap right now in women's sports versus men's sports. In the 90s, can you imagine what that was? So when I hear she's an Olympic medalist and I hear that she was on the first World Cup team, I assume she's a sports athlete. She had sponsorship, she had money. They were rolling out red carpets. But when she started telling me about her experience, it made me think about my high school theater performances. What I mean by that is that we were a team of rag, nag, get it together, do whatever it takes, spend long hours, because we were passionate about what we did. And she did not expect the theater comparison. I see her chuckling over there. My point being, she said to me, in order to be on that team, you knew not only did you have to be the best, you also knew that you were actively fighting for progress for yourself and the future generation every day. She said that you knew if you were on that team, you were fighting to be something bigger than what you could possibly imagine you were every moment. And I was like, can you imagine this young woman going to practice, doing her best to just be the best in a sport and already knowing she was building a space for future generations every single day? And I said, actually, I think some of us know what that's like because that's what many of us are trying to do with the environment. But she has been doing it for years, as many of you have, and she's been doing it from an incredible seat of honor, and she's done it with excellence. So introducing a woman that stands for impact, effectiveness, excellence, and understanding her role as a change maker, not only does she understand it, I'll have to say U.S. soccer president Sunil Gulati and many others have recognized it because this year she has won U.S. soccer's most prestigious award, the Werner Fricker Builder Award. You can only, yeah, clap. 
So even though this is not a traditional introduction to a moderator, we want to celebrate that award, Mary, and we want to acknowledge you for it because you, I'm going to get emotional. You get this award for building something outside of yourself, outside of your sport that has impact beyond your life and beyond over 20 years of service. That's the requirement for this award. Super prestigious, Mary. And will you please walk up to the stage while I read this beautiful quote about you. Mary's determination over the past three decades, decades has paved the way for the advancement of youth and women's soccer, not only in the United States, but across the world. Her work reflects her passion for the game, which transcends the sport to our everyday society. Her legacy as an all-star on and off the field will be cemented in U.S. Soccer's foundation for many years to come. Mary Harvey. Wow. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wow, I really didn't expect that. That's just, um, this is a, <laughs> wow. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm just recovering from that for a minute. Um, first of all, I want to thank our panelists who are terrific. I can't wait to introduce them. Um, who each bring um, a different perspective into the diversity and inclusion space. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, what, we're talking about diversity and inclusion, what's that, what's that mean? Well, if you think about whatever sports organization you represent, be it a league, be it a team, what have you, your brand touches um, your communities in a very, in a very special way. Your front office, you know, there's sort of different pieces of it. There's your front office, there's your locker room, there's your coaching staff, which probably, I don't know if you consider those front office, but the coaching staff, the fans, and then the communities that, you know, if you're at the top of the pyramid, it's, it's, it's all the areas underneath the pyramid that you touch through youth programs, through community outreach, through all these different things that you, as, as a brand, be it a team or a league, um, do to interact with your community and be a strong um, citizen in your community. So how do you as a team or league, as a brand, um, conduct your business? What's important to you? Your sense of social responsibility as a member of community, the city that you're in, or the, the sport that you represent, what do you stand for in terms of social values? and how that is translated through activities that touch your front office, that touch your coaching staff, that touch your locker room, that touches your fans, and touches your communities. So we're gonna talk about that and what that looks like um, from uh, four terrific uh, panelists. So I'd like to introduce them. We're going to start uh, with the NFL. So Andres Astralaga is currently the Vice President of Human Resources for the NFL Media, which consists of the NFL Network and digital media products. Uh, Andres leads all aspects of human resources, including recruitment and retention, training and development, employee relations, organizational design and learning, diversity and labor relations. Uh, Andres joined the NFL in 2012, uh, but prior to that held positions in HR leadership positions at Disney, ESPN, Barnes Aerospace, and NBC Universal. So I'd like to welcome Andres to the stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Billy Bean. Billy Bean serves at Major League Baseball. Thank you very much. Uh, Major League Baseball as Vice President and Special Assistant to the Commissioner. As a senior advisor to uh, the Commissioner, his role focuses on baseball social responsibility initiatives and LGBT inclusion. Among his responsibilities, um, Billy works with MLB's 30 clubs to bring awareness to all players, coaches, managers, umpires, employees, and stakeholders throughout baseball to ensure an equitable, inclusive, and supportive workplace for everyone. Uh, on July 14, 2014, Billy was announced as Major League Baseball's first ever ambassador for inclusion. So Billy is a member of MLB's Diversity and Inclusion Committee. He's the author of the book, Going the Other Way. 
He's also an advisory board member of the Sports Equality Foundation, aimed at providing support to LGBT athletes, coaches, and team leaders in every sport. Billy, happy to have you here. Uh, John Totora enters his fourth season as the Chief Operating Officer of Shark Sports and Entertainment, SSE, so the San Jose Sharks, NHL. Uh, John oversees all aspects of uh, SSE's business operation and represents the organization's ownership. He serves as an alternate governor for the San Jose Sharks to the NHL Board of Governors and for the San Jose Barracuda to the American Hockey League's Board of Governors. Uh, John works closely with Sharks General Manager Doug Wilson to establish and maintain a central, centralized and collaborative vision for the entire organization, encapsulating both hockey and business operation. Since being appointed COO in 2013, uh, Totora has focused on creating new opportunities to connect Sharks fans and corporate partners with the Sharks brand throughout the year. John Totora, everyone. Jerry up here. And finally, Stacy Wegzen. Stacy uh, begins her second season as the King's Vice President. Welcome, thank you. King's Vice President of Human Resources after serving um, as Associate Vice President of Human Resources West Coast for HGA for the past seven years. Uh, Wegzen was the Director of Human Resources for the Kings from 2001 to 2008. In her current role, she leads the human resources function by providing strategic direction and leadership in the areas of recruitment, employee relations, leadership development, organizational communications, diversity and inclusion, labor relations, legal compliance, wellness, and benefits administration. How on earth do you have time to be here? <laughs> <laughs> Wegson is proud to be part of the senior leadership team for one of the most diverse organizations in sports. From ownership to leadership, diversity and inclusion is top of mind and infused in the day-to-day -day business decisions and practices throughout the Kings and the NBA. Thank you very much, Stacey. Welcome. Okay, have you ever seen the Zach Galifianakis thing between two ferns? There's a fern and there's a fern. I'm feeling like I, I won't be as funny as Zach Galifianakis. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do is start off with, you know, I gave a little bit of, in, in the sort of initial remarks, a little bit about the space. So diversity and inclusion, what does that look like? depending on who you represent, right? And so let's talk a little bit about what does action look like for your organization in the diversity and inclusion space? Um, what does innovation look like? So action, what you've done, what you're working on, and then what's innovation look like? What is the next step? What's that look like uh, for you in your organization? So uh, let's start in reverse um, alphabetical order. So let's start with you first, uh, Stacy. Talk a little bit about what that looks like for you. Great. Well, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Well, first I'd like to start out by saying that I'm so proud to work for a team that truly embraces diversity and inclusion. And it starts with our owner, Vivek, and I know many of you had the opportunity to hear Vivek speak earlier in the summit. And Vivek has always championed an environment that embraces inclusion and openness where everyone has the opportunity to succeed. Um, on the recruiting front, one of the things that we've done is we've set a goal to really uh, develop a workforce that reflects the diverse community that we serve. And the way that we've approached that is to partner with local nonprofit agencies to bring employment opportunities to candidates that maybe we wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet earlier on. Um, one of those agencies is Women's Empowerment, and they do great work and helping women transition from homelessness to employment. And we've had great success working with their graduates, and they've really helped um, provide a unique perspective to our workforce and really connect with our fans in a special way. We've also recently partnered with Jobwell, and Jobwell is a recruiting firm who specializes in attracting minority candidates. 
And so that has really also helped us from a, a professional recruitment standpoint draw um, qualified candidates um, with diverse backgrounds. Uh, the other thing that we've done is we've really um, we, we set a goal to really create a common language within our organization and a shared vision around diversity and inclusion. And so we've incorporated uh, this learning in our professional development track. And so if, over the past few years, we've offered to our entire organization, and, and an organization this side, we're, we're in the thousands, um, but we've offered courses such as diversity awareness and uh, respect in the workplace and unconscious bias. And it's really helped us as leaders and individuals in our organization to explore how we're wired and um, to make sure that we really are open to embrace people from all different backgrounds. Um, I'm so proud of the fact that I sit on a senior executive team of nine people, and there's four of us at the table that are women. And so the great thing about that is that for the women coming up in our organization, they can look around and see role models. Um, and, and so we look to create that type of environment where everyone has an opportunity to succeed and grow in our organization. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the NBA's work in the area of diversity and inclusion. Um, the, they have developed an entire department that solely focuses on diversity and inclusion. And their purpose is really to educate and share best practices, engage um, teams and coaches and players um, with initiatives related to diversity, inclusion, equality, and tolerance. And so we appreciate them taking the lead and we feel like they're really you know, blazing the trail, not only in professional sports, but also um, in business in general. Um, obviously, looking around the Golden One Center, um, you can imagine that this, this has become a gathering place for our community. And um, it's really home to this entire region. And so we took great care in making sure that we designed a space that was welcoming and safe for everyone. And some of the things that you'll see, obviously, are um, we have uh, a very um, accessible design um, and with a lot of care and thought that went into that. Uh, there's lactation stations uh, for nursing moms. We have all gender restrooms um, before that was mandated by the state of California. So I think in addition to being the most technologically advanced and sustainable arena in the world, I feel like we're also the most progressive. Um, like my other panel members here, I'm sure they feel like I do, which is working in professional sports provides us an amazing platform to impact the type of social change that we wish to see in our community. And we're so proud to have a role in that, and we take that role with great responsibility. And so, um, you know, our work continues in this space. We have made great progress over the last few years. We have great support, um, not only from our fans and community, but also from our leadership teams and ownership teams. Um, but we're not, you know, we're not 100% um, down the path, but we're, we're getting there every day. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. And uh, thank you so much for attending the summit. I hope you've enjoyed your time at Golden One Center and the city of Sacramento. Thanks, Thanks so much, Steve. You know, a couple things you said. Uh, I did have the opportunity to hear your owner speak. And he talked about having that, that in Civilization 3.0, I'm sure you've heard this, um, you know, that, that stadiums, sport, sporting venues will become the cathedrals, you know, the gathering place of the community. And so that was envisioned when he was looking at building and the design for, for this place we're sitting in. And so I love the theme of that transposed across, you know, that that, that cathedral reflects the values and the character of the city where you reside. So how is the, just a follow-up question, how has the response been to the all-gender bathroom when you just, it's sort of linking it up with community response? Sure. Uh, the response has been overwhelmingly positive, and of course, you know, we heard a little bit of chatter early on from some conservative groups, but, but the positive feedback has far exceeded any concerns that were raised out of, out of that design. And so we knew it's 2017, it's absolutely the right thing to do. It was, a, it was honestly a no-brainer for us, so um, it made perfect sense given the environment and the culture we wish to create in our building. And so um, it's, it's been very, very positive. Excellent. Thank you, Stacey. John, um, talk a little bit about what action in this space looks like um, for you at the, at the Sharks 
and sort of what's next. So action, things you've been involved in with diversity and inclusion, um, and sort of what's next for what you're looking to do. Well, thank you again for having me here as well. My first time at this new facility, it's absolutely gorgeous. So congratulations to the Kings. Uh, like the Kings, uh, it all starts with ownership for the Sharks as well. Uh, the owner of the San Jose Sharks is, is Hasso Plotner, the co-founder of the SAP software company. And SAP, like most tech companies, a worldwide company, one of the more successful companies in the world, it's all about diversity. They're engineers, they're marketers, they're salespeople, a very diverse worldwide organization with offices all over the world. And that culture comes down to the Sharks as well. And that combination with the Sharks, as well as the NHL culture overall, leads to a very diverse environment. If you look at hockey, 65% of the players are Canadian. Uh, and that number was, was a lot higher years ago. It was 80, 85% of the players were Canadian, but yet most of the teams were in the US. And as time has gone on, you've seen more and more players from different parts of the world come into the NHL. Sweden, Finland, the Czech Republic, Germany. We've had a few from Asia, Russia, obviously. And so the league is getting more and more diverse. The league is getting more and more um, uh, players are being developed all over the world. And as one scout told me years ago, if you're a good hockey player, we will find you. It doesn't matter where you are or where you're from, uh, we will find you. So I think the culture of diversity with the NHL has been there, at least on a national basis, for quite some time, going back years. And that continues as, as we go on. Um, as it relates to the Sharks and the NHL, the NHL has really adopted um, a program called Hockey is for Everyone. Uh, every last year for the first time, the month of February, was uh, dedicated as Hockey is for Everyone month. Every player, every team uh, had a team ambassador, a player. In our case, it was Chris Tierney on the Sharks, who was our ambassador for Hockey is for Everyone. And really what it celebrated was, was inclusiveness. Uh, hockey is for everyone. If you can play hockey, you can play hockey. If you want to watch hockey, you can watch hockey. And uh, it really uh, generated an inclusive environment. And each team, during the month of February last year, uh, had a dedicated home game where we celebrate hockey is for everyone. Uh, we only had three home games in February. Our game was in March, but uh, we were okay. I had a fantastic night against the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, players in both clubs uh, uh, used prize ta uh, pride tape on their hockey sticks during warm-ups. Uh, there were special uniforms made uh, as well. And it was a celebration of inclusion uh, beyond just sexual, sexual orientation. There was religion, different groups as well. Uh, we had the Sikhs buy 500 tickets to the game that night, and uh, that was a fantastic experience. We had tables set up in the arena where people could uh, uh, try on turf hands and uh, experience that type of uh, um, endeavor as well. So we had many different things going on in the arena, and our fans really embraced it. There was no criticism. There was no conservatism. It was an open environment where people could, uh, could share and experience the game of hockey in a different way. And the feedback we got was tremendous. The feedback the lead got across the 30 teams, plus the Las Vegas team, which also celebrated hockey is for everyone, uh, even though they didn't have a team playing in February of last year, uh, was, was remarkable. So that's the way we try to embrace it, uh, not only in the locker room, but also on the ice. And, the, uh, and we look forward to that program continuing in a much more robust fashion as, as we go forward. So it's a fun time to be in, any, in, in the NHL. And from a practical standpoint, you know, we went to the Stanley Cup final in 2016, last June. And uh, obviously, when you go to the Stanley Cup final, you generate a lot new interest in the sport, many more season ticket holders and the like. Well, we had uh, a significant number of new season ticket holders, about 2,500 new season ticket holders coming into the 16-17 season as a result of the playoff run. And about 30% of them were, were Hispanic, which was a major um, a growth market for us and just shows the changing diversity of the Bay Area and also uh, the changing marketplace around us. And we have to be open and inclusive to all of that in order to be successful as well. Thanks so much, Sean. I love, um, the, I, I love the work of incorporating, I mean, we're a country with so many different cultures. And depending on your part of the country, you know, you can have, um, you know, different, different ethnic groups um, that are all to collectively make up this wonderful community that you're in. And I love the outreach, and particularly to, to use it as a platform for understanding. 
you know, a, a turban is different from, you know, uh, other things that uh, the people mistake it for. Billy Bean, you are a special assistant to the ambassador, uh, sorry, to the, uh, to the commissioner of baseball. Um, that is a new role um, that you're in with baseball. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because this is unique, I think. The, the, well, it's interesting over the, first of all, I'm happy to be here and with uh, some of my colleagues here at MLB. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, have a conversation. Um, it's an interesting, over the course of the three years that I've been uh, back in baseball, as my job has sort of changed and defined itself, there really was no definition when I started to be, uh, you mentioned I was the first ambassador for inclusion um, that MLB had ever made that decision uh, about. And one of the uh, interesting parts was that we were in a room, baseball had realized that it was time to expand its workplace protection um, to include sexual orientation, a simple decision like that. And then they felt they wanted someone to help communicate that role. And um, I was brought back after being away from baseball for an awfully long time. I'm a former player, played six years in the major leagues and quit right in the middle of uh, my career because of my things going on in my uh, personal life that didn't go so well at the time and being closeted. And, um, but the one thing I did ask, uh, I was hired when Commissioner Selig was still the commissioner, uh, was that if this conversation was to take place that I would be invited by the clubs because none of us were really sure how it would be uh, received and and um, everyone that I worked for embraced that decision and slowly but surely um, the unique part that I think helped gain some traction was that it was the first time a former player was talking to our players about a new conversation and the interesting um, timing in life where marriage equality was a very polarizing um, political conversation I, I don't think even the people at baseball realized how big um, the LGBT conversation was going to intersect with each and every day uh, activities, whether it's you know at stadiums or front office or, or what they see on TV every night. And our timing was was fortunate, and I had a chance to you know get in front of a lot of players by invitation, uh, make the conversation something that was very relatable, and and really. Uh, build and find a parallel to the, the original initiatives of, of what inclusion and acceptance is all about. And we, as the sport of Jackie Robinson, and, and like having that um, responsibility always be a priority to you know, what we convey in the messages, um, it just seemed to build on itself. And then I got more opportunity to get closer to the, the men and women that run baseball. And over time, I just uh, sort of morphed closer to the commissioner in that way. So it's, it's interesting. I think all of our jobs is a work in progress. You know, we learn something every day we wake up. The difference uh, from one year ago um, with the presidential administration to now, uh, the challenges and the opportunities or, or however you uh, view that has changed all of our jobs in a certain way. And, and um, for me, to as a former player and trying to stay uh, you know, uh, represents something that is relatable to our players and understanding. It's interesting for me to hear from a club perspective and then to, for us to talk about from a league-wide perspective because um, one of the things that my job is to do is to support club initiatives, not to mandate them or tell them that this is, you need to have a conversation on this day about this subject. It's uh, for me to really cultivate those relationships at the club level and see how we can support, support those. And I think that uh, moving forward, um, that responsibility just keeps to, you know, continuing to grow and grow. That's terrific. Um, you know, one thing, shifting to, to leagues and, and responding, I would say, or, or supporting teams, um, Andres, in uh, last year, I think it was last season, um, so I'd love to hear about what this looks like at the NFL, but also um, you had a team, um, you had Colin Kaepernick last year um, as, as, as part of the kneeling, I'm sure you remember all of this. Um, how did that affect, you know, what did that look like in the offices of the NFL? Yeah. And what did you learn from that as you work through, you know, this, I guess it's a broader discussion, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an ongoing dialogue. 
Uh, yeah, let me try to get to that answer uh, with my intro and okay. hopefully I can, great. I can get there. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this was the first time someone introduced me as Andres Astraga. That was very nice. Uh, it's usually Andre, Andres, and they butcher the rest, so I appreciate the intro. Um, the, for me, as an as a HR uh, practitioner, um, what we really need to look at from a diversity and inclusion is not just the words diversity and inclusion, right? We need to get to the spot of actually feeling like you are engaged, that you belong there. It's not so much about you know being hired into a position. Um, it's not so much about you know okay, I'm going to invite this individual person into this conversation, but having that individual person feel as though that they are a part of the organization, part of um, the solution. They are engaged in that. I think that's the the biggest takeaway, at least for me as I've run through my career from a diversity and inclusion is that piece of it, feeling like you are engaged, that you belong. Uh, that word belonging is, is really powerful, right? So you can have all these diversity uh, programs, you can feel as though that you're including everyone, come on in, have, have a seat at the table, but they never ask a question of the person. They never ask them, well, how do you feel about that? They never ask, you know, anything about the subject of, you know, that they are working on. So that's, that's really at the core here of what we're trying to get to, right? Um, a, sense, a sense of belonging, because once you have an employee or a person that feels like they belong, they become much more productive, they become much more creative, they become uh, really part of um, the culture and, and pushing the culture forward, right? So for us, you know, it's, it's, that's at the core of it. We are trying to get to uh, feeling um, of our employees, of our players, um, front office folks, that you know, they belong there, that they have a voice there. Uh, we, we, can, we can talk about the Rooney Rule, we can talk about you know, the Bill Walsh um, coaching um, uh, seminars that, that we end, end up doing, that, that's a great program. But it's not just opening the door and having the person sit and go through one of these programs. It's the sense of belonging and a sense of, can I, uh, is my voice going to be heard? So I think, you know, what we learned on the Kaepernick thing is, you know, you, you almost have to uh, get uncomfortable with, uh, with an uncomfortable situation. <laughs> I know there, I'm using the same word there, but um, what we end up doing is having conversation internally in the league about, you know, and, and with employees, sort of an unopened forum about these social issues. Um, and the important part of it is understanding sort of where the person's coming from. No one knows what it feels like to be a 10-year-old coming from Barranquilla, Colombia, and being dropped off in Syracuse in the middle of the winter. Um, no, no, nobody knows that better than me. Uh, that happened to me. I didn't speak a word of English. I had no idea about the culture, none of that. Um, so when we talk about sort of where we come from and having those social dialogues, we really need to stop, listen, and have these dialogues. And I think from that, the leagues ended up doing those dialogues. We had dialogues and initiatives in different clubs and players um, stepped forward and, and really took on that initiative. And I think one of the, the great things that came about it was several of them ended up going to the communities that they, they live or, and, and work and um, really have a, a sense of connectivity and bring in the, the social um, uh, neighborhood leaders and the police to talk about community uh, policing. So I think that was one great aspect of, of what happened with the Colin Kaepernick and obviously understanding a bit more about where people are coming from and their feelings and not sort of prejudging uh, relative to, to their point of view. So That's terrific. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to make sure I don't forget this part, which is um, we do have an opportunity for audience members of the audience to ask questions. We have some people up in there with their arms up. If you have a question, please write it down on a note card and we'll get it down here. 
try to get to some. We have, um, we're going to go into the discussion part. And one thing that, um, so I work with an organization called Athlete Ally. And Athlete Ally are athletes who are, um, and, and it is founded in LG, the LGBTQ community, but it's also, you know, talks about diversity and inclusion when it comes to other, other aspects of what that means. Um, and, and working with our founder, a guy named Hudson Taylor, he just, it all starts with education. All of it, when you're talking about, and you, and you mentioned it with, you know, the, the whole um, issue then, and the dialogue that came about with Colin Kaepernick. It's, there's a broader discussion here. And it starts with education and understanding different points of view. So I'd love to, I mean, and that can look at, you know, education of rookies. So I know with the NBA, they have a rookie program where they bring in players, and that's part of the educational piece that they go through. Um, and there are other programs as well. So um, there's the educational piece that's the front office, that's the coaches, that's, and, and we've all had you know, coaches who've been on one or other side of that you know, diversity and inclusion, um, uh, uh, well, more or less tolerant of that, I should say. Um, but then beyond that, um, you have the locker room, which is incredibly important. And then you have fans. So maybe talk a little bit about things that you found that work with the educational piece um, and from any part of, you know, angle you want to tackle it from. I can certainly talk about the uh, domestic violence and sexual assault training that we've done uh, the last several years. It's been three years. We do it at the club level. We do it at the league level. Um, and that came about, again, talk about diversity. Um, obviously, it, st it started, you know, and stemmed from the Ray Rice incident where the league, obviously, I think, um, you know, certainly did not have sort of the, the, the necessary resources um, to make the best decisions, perhaps. And um, learning from those mistakes and, and owning them and, and realizing that it, it is about trying to figure out who's in the room and what voices and what points of view come forward in order for us to really do some social change um, and some uh, training and also opening up uh, people's uh, view of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, I sit in a committee for the league um, in terms of a rapid response, in terms of issues that come forward, and there's about 10, 12 of us that sit on this committee, and we all, half of us are internal, half of us are external. I have a unique perspective just from the fact that before I started in HR, um, I went to grad school, I was a victim witness advocate at the Massachusetts uh, District Court in Waltham. Um, so I dealt a lot with domestic violence um, and, and these type of sexual assaults and received training through the DA's office. So I had a unique perspective. Um, and through that training, I was able to sort of be part of this uh, internal league-wide initiative. And I think year over year, it really has opened up the dialogue. It has opened up sort of a perspective that obviously we didn't have before. And we certainly want to be the leaders within sports, within um, the industry to push forward domestic violence, sexual assault, um, and really start that dialogue, I think, Again, it starts from diversity, and it starts from sort of how we, we view ourselves and view internally, and how we can really push forward from a, a society standpoint uh, something really positive. Okay, great. Billy? Well, I think it, it's, for us in baseball, we have a unique situation because our player development piece is so dynamic compared to the other sports. Um, we have seven or eight levels of minor league baseball. We have academies in you know South America. We have the most diverse collection of athletes who ascend to our uh, to the major leagues. And and the learning by mistakes and and seeing the moments now. The, in the past, uh, players did not have the ability to represent the brand within 10 seconds of a post on their smartphone. And um, and understanding that along with that. Uh, even a better business practice, but just the, the responsibility of uh, providing life skills. And we have a tremendous group 
um, that has dedicated itself. Uh, I have a couple colleagues here, uh, Melanie Legrand and Paul Hanlon, who's been, uh, you know, obviously the reason that baseball's here, elevated the conversation in sustainability. Um, understanding that we, it has to be a collaborative effort and what the, that short opportunity that we have to be in front of players and where does that responsibility begin and how do we integrate it um, in a way that's efficient um, and maximizes that opportunity. And, and um, you know, obviously with other examples and that cross boundaries of sports, when you see um, athletes who have um, had a moment of a disparaging remark or a terrible uh, incident of violence or, or um, you know, PED use or alcohol and driving, mixing, all those things, we've all had examples that break our hearts, you know, in the moment, and then you realize that to try to use that to inspire or be an example that the players can grab hold to immediately. And I think that um, the inclusion conversation folds right into that and in, in trying to find uh, ways for us, at least in baseball, to work in our SR working group. It is the, the priority we have um, of putting information that is relatable and that the kids can take into their lives from that moment forward. And because they all, all every athlete that represents all of our sports um, is an ambassador to the, the team they play for, the sport that they, they participate in. Um, and that is a, a changing dynamic them from even 10 years ago. Um, well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I was at an event in Seattle um, last, last week and it was all the major sports teams getting together around Pride Week, they had a Pride Week. And, um, and it was a member of the, the captain, one of the captains of the uh, Seattle Sounders saying, you know, okay, so also a diverse locker room. So you have different cultures, um, different countries, you know, from, you know, Africans, so Nigerians and people from Central and South America, um, Europe. It's a very, very diverse locker room and different perspectives. So, you know, how as, as, as a locker room, you know, being sort of the boss of the locker room as team captains are, how do you start to communicate and educate? Um, and, and, you know, Brad said it's about, you know, when you hear something that speaks maybe from a position of ignorance around a particular issue, it's about putting your arm around, you know, that teammate and saying that, that's enough. Right? That, that's not what we do here. You know, this is the community we're in. So you, you spend a lot of time in, you know, working with players in your role, um, how do you see, I mean, it's 30% Hispanic, right, in Major League Baseball, 30% Hispanic, but also other, other countries yeah. as well, right? Right. Well, I think that the first challenge that I felt with that, there's only been in 150 year history of Major League Baseball, two men who ever came out of the closet that played in the Major Leagues, disclosed that they were gay, um, and uh, Glenn Burke was the other who played in Oakland, um, not far from here. Um, passed away almost 25 years ago. So there's been zero representation until I got back into baseball in a public way. Um, so the first for me was to be an example that was, you know, young men uh, hang on to stereotypes and the feminization of, of women has always been, the, uh, or feminization of men, which is disparaging to women, has been the way that men challenge each other, you know, in a moment of aggression or violence or, or on the field or wherever. Um, so changing that culture and that, that dialogue has been uh, paramount. But for me, the simplicity of being an example that they can relate to as a former player, um, we put together uh, something, and this is exactly what we're talking about, in the clubhouse, in that environment, um, that dispels those initial baggage stereotypes that are so easy for people to hang on to um, so living up uh, to that process and being someone, um, for example, we show, uh, whenever I talk to the players, we usually show um, a capsule of me as a former player. I'm older than they are, but I did play. And that is a, that's finding a common ground. And I challenge, you know, most athletes in any environment, that uh, we have tremendous, you know, youth outreach as well. But uh, when you're talking directly to the players, um, and you talk about, you know, allies, we have no out athletes in any of the, major sports, so allies have to be a part of the conversation. The assumption that there are no gay people until they decide to share that and, yeah. and to not worry about that fact as much as the culture in, in that world around them. So taking away 
the stigma attached to being an ally or a buddy or, some, or endorsing, saying something, accepting in social media um, if you have uh, a, a hockey night for everyone or uh, an, an NBA pride night or we've had a tremendous expansion of that around baseball. Those are opportunities for players to fall back into stereotypical comments, making jokes or the media to kind of ambush them for a naive 20 year old kid who just came up from the big leagues who's from Colombia or Dominican Republic that conversation in their home country is different than what it is in Los Angeles it's different from what it is in Kansas City and it might be different from what's in Sacramento until the last couple of years until it becomes a priority we have to allow the guys to understand uh, and our women female the, the bigger picture that why it's so important to take away those stereotypes and not allow those to continue yeah, we, we had a former player, Ryan O'Callaghan, a few weeks ago um, he sort of come out that he was gay and he worked, uh, he played six years. And my favorite uh, uh, chip in this story is when he sat down with Scott Pioli, who's the general manager um, for the Chiefs at the time. And, and basically he, Ryan told uh, Scott, you know, I'm, I'm gay. And, and uh, Scott was like, so what's the problem? Like. So, like, you know, and he told him how he felt uh, a shame and he was, you know, about to commit suicide and all these things. And Scott's response was the, the way we sort of want it to be. Like, what's the problem? Like, so you're gay, so what? Like, <laughs> what's, what's the problem? <laughs> but so, so... That's an example of how important it is from the leadership positions to educate the players. And if Ryan could have had that conversation when he was still playing, it might have changed his life. And it is, Scott Pioli is an amazing example of somebody who is fearless in understanding his platform is so influential. And that is how we change a culture. That's a great example. So let's move from, to the team level. So for, for, for that athlete, that athlete is a, a player in middle school or in high school who is of color or closeted or figuring things out or what have you, and <clears throat> they're, in, they're in sports. So teams are active in their communities, right? They're, you engage with you know, schools, hospitals, right? You're, you're an active player in the communities where, where you um, operate. What do you feel is your responsibility or your opportunity, to put a different bend on it, to contribute in a positive way to that discussion, either around um, inclusion or just being a safe place in terms of what your brand stands for as it relates to you know, kids who are coming through um, and, and feeling perhaps not a part of because of the bias that exists, be it around color, be it around nationality, immigrant kids who come in, refugees, immigrants, what have you. I mean, we live in a very interesting time right now, right? So any thoughts from the teams on that? So Stacia, or sure. John? <laughs> sure. Well, I think, um, thankfully, we've got a great group of players who really enjoy the work and the opportunity to be in our community. And they realize that um, they have a unique position to really impact um, a young person's life, a young athlete's life. And so, you know, obviously, there's, um, you know, NBA is a, uh, basketball is a worldwide sport, and so our draw and reach is, is, is worldwide. And we find ourselves in the position of um, making sure that people understand that there's opportunities for everyone to engage in this sport. And our players have been great at um, facilitating those conversations, being part of our community, um, and no different than the other leagues represented here today, the NBA has done a great job through player development to make sure that our players understand their role in society. And so um, there's, there's definitely a lot of opportunities to impact youth in a positive way. And um, we run a lot of camps throughout the summer. Our players are actively involved and they um, really actually enjoy that experience and, and make themselves available to really connect with um, young athletes in a, in a positive way. Terrific. John, do you want to add on to that? Sure. I think, the, uh, I think there are a few things here. One is, uh, touch upon what Billy said, education of the player is, is critical. We, uh, the NHL had their draft last weekend in Chicago, 
and the teams now take their draft picks and bring them into development camps during the summer. Our development camp is next week in San Jose, and sure enough, part of the training, there'll be 50 players there, part of the training is, is educating the player on, on what to do, what not to do, talk about inclusion, talk about the fact that nothing good happens outside after 11 o'clock at night, all those types of things, right? Uh, and that's all part of it. So the education is real and starts very, very early. The other thing too is, is much like athletes in all sports, they're better prepared physically and also mentally to be professional athletes at a younger age than they were probably 15, 20 years ago. So an 18 year old today is better prepared to play professionally or play in college or whatever the case may be than perhaps his, his dad was. And, uh, and therefore they're, they're more educated, they're more well-rounded. NHL players, more and more of them are going to college uh, while they may be drafted at 18, they're going back to college for two or three years and perhaps even graduating. From a hockey standpoint, a college is a development system in some respects that the teams don't have to pay for. Uh, so if a player can stay in college, that's actually a good thing. But so players are, are coming out and playing at a professional level a lot more educated perhaps than they were in the past, which is a benefit. Um, the other factor is we have a, a, a lot of youth programs in San Jose. We have the Junior Sharks Travel Hockey Program. It has tra 28 travel teams, all ages from might level, which is six years old, to, to midget level, which is 17, 18, boy and girl. Uh, so we have the inclusion aspects there. And, and it's, the same, it's the same issue, is, is if you can play hockey, you can play in that team. We don't care where you're from. We don't care how much money you make. Uh, the parents are good about inclusion. The coaches are very good about inclusion. It's all about teaching the kids how to play, play the game. And they're able to see our, our major Sharks Ice Rink, uh, Solar for America Ice Rink, where the, where the Junior Sharks play, is also the same rink where the Sharks play and our AHL team, the San Jose Barracuda, play in practice, right? So they, they get the model of the NHL players, how they perform off the ice, what they do on the ice, that sort of thing. So it's, it, the players are very well intertwined in, in the community. As for our employees, we go through a, uh, a brief orientation with them when they start, small group orientation. I'm involved in it, tell them the, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of the organization, but also what to do and not to do. Uh, and it's real simple. Uh, one of our former owners, Kevin Compton, said to me once when he hired me, he's like, just do the right thing. It's that simple. And we try to share that message to, to the employees when they start. Uh, and it's also not just for them to do the right thing, but it also empowers them to speak up when they see something else is going on that's wrong. And I think now uh, employees are a lot more intelligent and, uh, and they're probably more empowered to speak up when they see something wrong or to uh, uh, impose positive peer pressure on colleagues. So it, it all kind of works. I, I would just add, you know, with our athletes and, and even having the privilege to work for the NFL and for uh, professional sports leagues, um, it, it's a privilege, right? So with, with great privilege, you know, comes great responsibility. And it's our responsibility at the league level at the coach's level to really set the right tone. I think I'll echo what, what Billy said is really to drive that and to create a, and, and foster an environment that it is open door, that we are pushing those, those, those things forward from a society standpoint. Terrific. Uh, I'd like to um, pivot to address some of the, the questions, got some great ones from the audience. Let's talk about fan behavior. So I come from a sport, um, so I'm, I guess I'm representing soccer since MLS isn't here. But uh, I come from a sport that internationally has absolutely abominable fan behavior. Um, the, the players um, of color in Italy, Spain, what have you, terrible treatment by fans, um, some parts of South America. Um, but then also um, their chants on television, which you can hear if you turn on the, the, the World Cup qualifiers and you hear chants for, um, during some of those games, if you speak depending on what languages you speak, you understand what they're saying. And, um, and it's not something that um, I think that you would hear here, probably. Uh, my question is, is, you know, there's, there's proactive and there's reactive, right? So proactively, um, what, can, what kind of leadership can we take, be it a team or as a league, around messaging, and, and again, through, you know, whatever mechanisms you have through players, through front office, what have you, around um, fan behavior and a tolerant and safe place to enjoy the, whatever sport you're there for. But then also, um, 
Um, well, let's just start there. What, what obligation um, do we have proactively to set a standard? And then how can we be on top of our game when the unfortunate happens? So unfortunate things do happen. There's, and in this, you know, perhaps, um, yeah, in this political climate, there's maybe more or less, more of that, there may be less of that, we don't know. But just talk a little bit about the proactive piece and the reactive piece of how you deal with setting fan behavior in a way that it's socially inclusive and accepting. Well, baseball just had an unfortunate example that's very timely. Um, one of our superstar players, Adam Jones, was uh, playing in Boston. He plays in Baltimore. Um, and I think the, the unfortunate, anytime there are human beings, you know, we, especially in this era, because people garner attention so much easily, everybody has a platform, and sadly, there's a desire to be demonstrative in other ways, but I, I think... Uh, the example that we were proud of in, uh, in an unfortunate situation in baseball was the way that, the, the, in this case, the Boston Red Sox acted uh, immediately um, when a fan made a disparaging remark to um, um, a player, Adam Jones, that, uh, and he was, they were removed from the stadium and they were banned for life. And that, the simple Clear. fact of that um, act, you know, and the immediate nature of it, Trusting the player from another team that this is what happened, which, you know, we are all a family, all, you know, every athlete that, you know, plays. But um, that sends a message, sent a message throughout baseball that this will no longer be tolerated. We are, we are improving. We are getting better. Our intentions are getting better. We're not perfect. But I think the, the immediacy of a decision like that is paramount for all of us in, in situations to educate for that the, to our fans who we want to come to the game, that our players or uh, other people in the stadium are not subject to, um, everyone must be treated equally. And uh, that was a powerful statement. It was the lead news story for two or three days. Our player was extremely brave in talking about it. It was a lot of attention. And you know, when you do that, it brings unwanted attention your way. And uh, we were there to be as supportive as we could. But um, the, the, the immediate nature of that, for me, was a sign of progress. So, so redirect just real quick, proactive and reactive, how much of what went into the Red Sox being able to respond like that was having thought about the issue beforehand versus trying to deal with it in real time, which is, you know, you got this much time to get a statement out. It's very, very important, right? Just well, I was going to say, didn't Adam get a standing ovation the following day? From, from the Boston fans, exactly. Boston and that's fans. a wonderful sign. And it was interesting because the majority of the response, that Bostonians did not want to be represented by this one person's bigotry. And in the past, it would have gone unnoticed. There was, there's so many things that were just ignored in the past. And, and when you're trying to change a culture, that's how you do it. And it really, uh, something positive came out of a terribly unfortunate moment. That's a great example. It's about, you know, it happens. What do you do next? Any thoughts, Stacy, on your side or John? Well, in terms of being proactive, whether our guests realize it or not, when they buy a ticket to attend a game or an event at Golden One Center, they are essentially agreeing to our code of contact, conduct. And obviously, we have a zero tolerance policy on, on um, disrespectful behavior, and we too are quick to remove fans and guests that are not um, acting properly. And so I think in terms of trying to get in front of it, making sure that anybody who plans to attend an event here understands our expectation um, of a respectful environment and then making sure that when those situations unfortunately happen, that we respond swiftly and we respond in a way that sends a message to others that this is not the place to, to act inappropriately. And we, we were also a very proactive from our beginning. The Sharks uh, began playing in 1991. SAP Center opened in 1993. And it was the, uh, the first major professional sports team to call San Jose home and to use the San Jose name. So the arena in, in and of itself and the team was a very, very uh, big community asset and still is, obviously. So it was important for us to create an environment at the time. I, I was not there, obviously, but to create an environment at the time, a very strong people management, customer service plan, uh, primarily with our ushers uh, in terms of welcoming people, having a very consistent standard of behavior, high level standard of behavior, both for the, 
the ushers themselves, but also uh, how they maintain uh, uh, fan, fan behavior and, and manage it throughout uh, events, both hockey and concerts. And that standard has maintained itself for the last 25 or so years, where I think to a person, anyone who's gone to the SAP Center, finds it a very safe environment to bring children, very safe environment, uh, regardless of your background. And that's something we're very proud of. That's terrific. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your, your time and your willingness to, to provide candor and um, just contribute to this ongoing discussion. Um, so I'd like to uh, um, wrap up because we have a panel coming after us, but just a round of applause for our extraordinary panelists. Thank you so much. And fascinating to hear about what diversity and inclusion means from the different perspectives that you bring. So thank you so much. And um, I think we are now handing it back to Joe Kerala for our next session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary, Billy, Stacy, John, and Andreas. That was pretty amazing. Uh, just a few remarks before we head into our next speaker. Um, the notion that the cathedral reflects the values of the community, not just in the building, but in the diversity of the organization. That hockey is truly for everyone doesn't just mean across gender, it means across sexual orientation, even religion, as well as ethnicity. That every day we wake up to new challenges and opportunities, and being a former player has an ability to help support, get other players to understand that and supporting the club's initiatives. And then the complexities of, and I really like this sentence, being willing to be uncomfortable in an uncomfortable situation. That's not an easy thing to do. Seeing the bigger picture and needing to see others so we assume, we don't assume they don't exist. These are really, really important points and thanks again to our panel, Mary, Billy, Stacy, John, and Andreas for making that very, very important points. Now next, I'd like to um, welcome up to the stage Diana Dean, Executive Director of the International Surfing Museum to help introduce our next keynote. Diana. Hi, everybody. I am so stoked to be here, first of all. And, and thanks, Joe, for the introduction. Um, it, many of you were here yesterday when you heard about, heard about the power of surfing to connect to our clean oceans. And you heard about Duke and what he was doing and, and connecting as a, you know, a, a professional surfer with a dad and a legacy. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention is we also launched the Climate and Sports Student Summits this week, and it was amazing to see these kids, and I really want to thank the Green Sports Alliance, Justin and Scott, and Mary, who stood up as the Olympian um, to showcase how these kids, we can move this forward with these kids. There's about 60 kids, and I also want to thank you for humoring them, because they were running all over the place and, and taking names and asking a lot of questions. So I firmly believe that this is the most important thing we can be doing right now to harness the power of our next generation to really create our sustainable planet. And I got to tell you, I got to give a shout out to the Climate and Sports Student Summit team. Linda's right there. It was amazing. So thank you guys all for coming together. And big, you know, let's give it up for the, the Green Sports Alliance and the, the uh, Kings who stepped up every single step along the way. So one thing I wanted to say as well is I don't think there's a better time right now in the history of surfing to be able to connect the power of the sport along with what's going on in our oceans. 40% of, of of our food supply, protein food supply, comes from our oceans. In addition to that, if you think about it, any place in the world, every second breath we take is thanks to our oceans. Whether you're in the middle of the US or you know, in, a, in another part of the world, every second breath we take is thanks to our oceans. So it's important to keep them clean and healthy. Um, I'm really excited that surfing is, is now going to be in Tokyo 2020. We're excited about LA 24. We're excited about Olympics becoming an, a, you know, a sport, the surfing becoming an Olympic sport. So with that, I do want to introduce you to a very dear friend of mine who's been a pioneer in the sports uh, surfing world for many, many years. Um, there's so much about him that I could say, but I thank him um, as a coach personally to me. Um, 
Peter P.T. Townen. He was the very first world professional surfing champion in 1996. He uh, was ranked one of the top five world surfers from 1996 to 1979. He formed the active ATE, it's called Active Empire, in 2003, a brand consulting company, especially in brand management, athlete representation, and special event marketing in the surf and skate markets. It's pretty special to hear what he's been doing in pioneering the sport of surfing all these years. He's been d inducted into the Surfing Hall of Fame and the Surfers Hall of Fame in Huntington Beach, where we're both from, um, so we're representing. And we're also inviting the world to come to Huntington Beach for the Summer Games, in addition to being inducted to the Australian uh, Surfing Hall of Fame. So he's been everywhere. In 2013, he was given the Lifetime Achievement Award at the annual SEMA Waters, Waterman's Ball that you're going to hear about in a minute. That stands for the Surf Industry Manufacturers Association, and he's currently residing half-time in Surf City, USA, Huntington Beach, but also, also in the island of Hunan, China, which you're going to hear quite a bit about. He's the appointed national coach of the first ever China national surfing team. This is big. This is a big shift, um, and it's changing the world. He's going to continue to compete internationally to qualify for the 2020. He's taking China to 2020 Tokyo Olympics, where the sport of surfing will be considered as the new Olympic sport for the first time in history. That's amazing. Um, we're, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. We're about to hear how he's using the environment to bridge generations to make a lasting impact for our future. Let's give it up for Peter P.T. Townen. Just give me a second. How's everybody doing out there today? Surf, surf's up in Sacramento, right? <laughs> Actually, not too far down the road. Uh, Kelly Slater, the world's greatest surfer ever, has built a wave park not too far from here, and the surf's up not too far from here. But um, it's great to be here. Actually, that last uh, panel was really uh, intriguing for me, uh, as Diana was talking about diversification and, uh, and different social agendas. Well, I've been living in China, and dealing with the Chinese government for sport is not like uh, a lot of ways we have to deal with our sport here in America and diversification and just social issues and dealing with athletes and the Chinese government is very interesting. But um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is uh, can surfing in the Olympics help save our Earth? And uh, with surfing getting into the Olympics, uh, there's a huge opportunity for us to make a difference. Uh, when the statement was made uh, that surfing was going to be in Tokyo 2020, uh, the future of surfing changed forever. Uh, just recently, Casey Wasserman, who's the chairman of the, the, the bid for 2024 LA, he said, uh, you can go around the world and ask what a green jacket is, and a small minority will know. And we all know what a green jacket is. It's what you win in the golf's masters. But if you go around the world, not too many people know this. But you can go around the world and ask uh, people what a gold medal is, and everybody, well, that's what you win in the Olympics. And as a result, um, you know, Kelly Slater might not want to hear this, but the two people who win the gold medals in Tokyo for surfing will arguably be the most famous surfers that have ever lived, just because of the audience reach. And, um, and it's going to be a huge platform for surfing to be exposed to the world. You know, uh, I've got this PowerPoint that you see up here. This is just actually, I was just in France uh, for the ISA World Surfing Games. Uh, which has been around for 50 years. And just in that alone, the result of surfing being the Olympics, in 2016, there were only 26 nations 
that competed. In France last month, there were 47 nations, including myself being there with the first ever China national team. So just that alone can tell you that the difference that surfing being recognized by the IOC is going to make in the world. I hope this is going to work. Oh, you know, might might help if I might help if I hold it the right way, right? Actually, we want to go back one. So um, I'm sure everyone in the room's heard of Duke Kahanamoku. Uh, he's kind of the godfather of the sport of surfing. Uh, of course, the Polynesians. At least the, the theory is that they invented surfing, but Duke Kanamoku, of course, was a Hawaiian representing America that won a gold medal, the first one, in, in, uh, in 1912 uh, in Stockholm. And um, he won more gold medals as time went on. But he always said, you know, look, he was in, in the Olympics for swimming, but his sport he loved was surfing. And it was always his dream that uh, surfing would become an Olympic sport. You know, on a personal note, Duke toured Australia because of the gold medals and swimming uh, way back in the early days, not too long after Stockholm in 1914. And uh, he saw how great the waves were in my home country. And it didn't take him long before he got a chunk of wood and then he actually carved a surfboard, which still exists today in Australia. He carved that surfboard and he went surfing and, and, and showed us in Australia, you know, what surfing could be. Well, here we go a hundred years later and, and Duke's dream of surfing in the Olympics has come true. So this is uh, the greatest surfer that's ever lived, Kelly Slater. He's won the world title 11 times. I won it once. <laughs> the, the closest I ever got to getting there again was I, got, I was second. Uh, I, at the end of the season and fell back to fifth. But uh, to win an, a world title 11 times in any sport, could be argued it's the greatest record in sport that exists. He's still in contention. Uh, he's currently still competing at the age of 45 and still winning world-class tournaments. Uh, he says he's gonna win 12, but I think the time might be passed. But just to actually compete into your 40s at that level has been pretty amazing. And this is him at uh, one of the surf breaks that uh, is on the World Championship Tour. Actually, they just finished this event uh, a week ago. It's in Tavarua, Fiji. And for surfers, this is our playground. I mean, the ocean, we don't have surfing if there's not beautiful waves and clean ocean. And this is where we have an opportunity going forward uh, to really connect uh, environmentally with the world. You know, surfers uh, are close to the environment, um, closer to the environment than most Olympic sports of today's summer games. And it's in their best interests uh, to care. And that is why a group of surfers in the early 80s uh, formed the Surf Rider Foundation to protect the oceans and their shorelines. And today there are surf rider chapters in all major surfing nations of the world. Uh, the Olympics can allow us to spread that environmental word to a whole lot more. So China gets into the sport of surfing. And that's all stemming from surfing gonna be in Tokyo 2020. It was, um, Interesting, when that announcement was made, I happened to be in China. I work on an event uh, called the Silver Dragon, which is on a, a river bore in the city of Hangzhou. That this wave comes down the river, eight to 10 foot wave, uh, when the moon and the sun come close together once a month. But in September, that wave gets as big as eight to 10 feet, like you're in Hawaii. And we hold a professional competition. So I happened to be there when the announcement came that surfing was going to be in 2020 Tokyo. And the next day, uh, the Minister for All Olympic Sport for China flew down to have dinner with me. And uh, he looked at me and he said, so how are we going to get any good at this? Because now it's in the Olympics. And in China, I mean, Olympic sport is everything. I mean, they have, you know, soccer and basketball and, 
and other sports, but winning a medals in the country for China is what it's all about. And I said to him, well, first we have to teach the Chinese how to swim. <laughs> he he, he kind of laughed at me. And, uh, and so you know what he did next? He made an appointment for me to go to the Hangzhou Swim Academy, which is where Sun Moon, who won the gold medal in Rio, this last Olympic Games, came from as, as a young kid, so that the, he could show me, you know, like how they train people to win the medals. And, uh, and so he thought, oh, if, he, if he sends me to the swim academy, I'm going to find a bunch of teenagers that like, can become surfers. And the problem is the swimming pool isn't like the ocean. The ocean moves, the swimming pool doesn't. And many of those students that were in the swim academy, they've never even seen the ocean. And uh, so I said, well, not quite. So moving that forward a little bit, there are Chinese people surfing, only in their first generation, though. In our world, you know, we've got maybe six generations of surfing, you know, 100 years plus of surfing. But in China, the young Chinese uh, start surfing not young because in that country still, you, it's a little like it was for us in the 60s. You go to school, get an education, get a job. You don't go to the beach and like screw around going surfing. So most surfers don't start surfing till they're like, you know, maybe 18 or 20. So through word of mouth, moving that forward is uh, they, they're serious about surfing. So they got a hold of me and, and I had to go through resume check and, and I wasn't the only candidate but I was appointed the first ever national coach for the Chinese national surfing team for the government. And they handed me a team of surfers, men and women, that there was no real process how they selected them. It was just word of mouth. I heard this guy surfs, that girl surfs, here they are. And so the next thing I know, I'm living on a tropical island in China called Hainan. It's off the coast of, uh, off the coast below Hong Kong, off Vietnam. And it's a beautiful tropical island and there's waves and, and the water's warm and palm trees and it's just like, it, it's just actually, it's like living in a time warp. <laughs> because out in the bay, Rayu Bay, which is on the northern side, just a little like Oahu with, with Hawaii, uh, there's waves and particularly in the winter time, there's lots of waves. And so I've been living out there with this group of kids and teaching them how to get better at surfing. It's real interesting, there's a bit of a surf community going on and, and really there's not too much yet going on on the mainland even though they have a thousand miles of coastline. But, but in living out there for a while and actually living in the community, it, it, it is interesting in that a time warp, it feels like I'm living in the north shore of Hawaii or in my hometown of Australia 40 years ago. Because the people who actually live there that aren't part of the surfing team program, they're the people who have left the mainland and gone, screw this, I'm leaving the system, I'm moving, I'm moving to the country, and I'm going to figure out how to make some money so I can surf every day. And then, just like it was 40 years ago for me, you know, there's, there's a beach bar at night, and the guys are there trying to get, up, get with the girls, and the next day, there's hopefully there's some waves, and you get up and you do that again. And uh, because surfing in this country is in its, in, in its first generation, and really, the kids are only starting to get enough freedoms right now that they can actually go to the beach and go surfing. And um, so it was really interesting. So after spending uh, quite a few weeks training these kids, we went to the first ever World Surfing Games for China. Now, World Surfing Games, as I said, has been around for 50 years. And this is a photo that... Uh, Getty Images took because for China to turn up at the World Surfing Games, it's not like, say, uh, a Central America country that's maybe got surfing, but China turns up at the, at the World Surfing Games and it's a big deal because, you know, China's one of the most recognized countries in the world and in, in Olympic competition, arguably, you know, one of the top three nations for, for a long time. And uh, you can see that's me standing in the middle here in France. And, and the government was kind of cool at first. 
about, look, we're going to go there and get an experience and see what, because I said, well, we don't even know who we are. <laughs> and until we compete and find out who we are and what number. And uh, so we went there, and we got beat pretty severely. But now we have a number. We're number 39 in the world. <laughs> now the work begins, right? Because now the government has expectations. So how do we get better than number 39 in the world? You know, you can see there's a couple of countries behind us, Ireland, uh, uh, Greece, you know, Dominican Republic. Uh, interesting one right in front of us is uh, Senegal. Okay, I'm training my Chinese kids down at the beach one day in France. And these four tall black teenagers turn up in front of me. I have no, I have no idea where they're from. They start doing exercises on the beach. And uh, all of a sudden, they're out in the surf. And they actually surf pretty good. Actually, they surf better than my Chinese guys. I'm going, how did that all happen? Well, it happened because surfing is going to be in the Olympics. In Senegal, everyone forgets. And most people probably in this room have heard of the endless summer. And Bruce Brown made that film back in the 60s, you know, 50 years ago. The first place they went, if everyone remembers, was Senegal. And the, these kids have been surfing there, but they've had no ever reason or no way to get to the, to the ISA World Games because they had no money. But now the government gave them money to go. And actually, they didn't bring any girls on this trip. They only had the four men, and they did pretty... They beat us. <laughs> Uh, and th that's the power of what that's going to mean that surfing gets into the Olympics. But th that's where it gets interesting from a point of view of, you know, why we're here, the Green Sports Alliance and, and sustainability in the environment, in that... Uh, Already, as a result on Hainan Island, uh, I've got the surf kids in the team picking up the trash because there in China at the moment, there, there's really no real beach culture yet, even though they have 400 million people that live within 50 miles of the beach, but there's no roads to the beach yet. But the government has identified that... Uh, Wow, we've had we have this asset, a thousand miles of coastline with waves and beaches, and and uh, and they're gone. Well, we should explore what this can mean. People go to the beach to just like maybe ha have a picnic, and they just leave their trash behind because there's actually no trash bins, and uh, on the beaches, and the water's not polluted. The water in the island is beautiful, clear, you know, just like you're in Hawaii or Fiji. But stuff's floating in and landing on the beaches all the time. I mean, I walk around and I go. And so already I implemented uh, with, with the team and the kids that, you know, when we went to these beaches that we'd take some trash bags and pick up the trash. And uh, this is a couple of the girls that are on the uh, Chinese national team here picking up some of the trash. And uh, this, this is where um, we can really, if you think about it, in the build-up to the Tokyo Olympics uh, message through surfing and the ISA World Games over the next couple of years, which are going to be the qualifying process, uh, in somewhat same way, not every country in the world is going to get in. My China team might not be good enough and might not make it. We're going to try. But just like, you know, soccer, uh, like the US did not get in in the men's, but they got in in the women's, we might not make it. So. It's going to be very interesting in the next couple of years with the ISA World Surfing Games uh, as we go through a qualifying process, who's going to make it and who's not. And like I say, our opportunity to reach the world um, is going to be like it's never been before, just because of the size of the audience that the Olympics brings uh, uh, to the to the world, and uh, that's where I think we have a really great chance to make a difference with surfing.
Oh, wrong way. So um, here, here's what can happen as a result. Um, and this is all stemming from the Olympics. And to give credit to Diana from the International Surfing Museum, this was her idea uh, that, wow, we, we, so surfing's going to be in Tokyo. So let's try and help Mayor Garcetti and Casey Wasserman make sure that the next Olympics is in LA because, hey, we're Southern California. This is surfing. And, and uh, hey, we should have it in Surf City, Huntington Beach. And um, so she had this great idea that we were going to do the Olympic rings as a paddle out under the Olympic Committee with all its strict regulations wouldn't allow us to do the rings. And so we did the Circle of Honor. And uh, you probably saw it on the news. Uh, last, last Tuesday it was, uh, over 500 surfers turned up in Huntington Beach and paddled out and created the biggest circle of honor in the history of the sport and got a Guinness uh, World Record. And uh, Diana led the way on that and the International Surfing Museum. But it just shows you what's possible and what can be done from surfing. And this is only the beginning. Uh, the power to mobilize the surfing culture globally can come over the, the years of this next decade uh, leading into Tokyo. So I just think we have this incredible opportunity uh, that, 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 you know, has never existed before uh, to reach people about keeping the oceans clean and, and beaches clean and because the oceans are so important to our lives today. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm sure we'll probably hear more about surfing in the Olympics. Uh, of course, USA being one of the prime surfing nations will be re well represented, I'm sure. Thanks very much. Thank you, PT. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've got to hand you back your little OK, <laughs> great. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's pretty amazing when you think about the opportunities that this moment in time has in many different ways, as PT just spoke of the oceans. And we're going to hear more about the oceans here in a minute. What's going on with the playground of 40% of our protein? And, and what can we do about it? And how can surfing possibly, uh, with its presence at the Olympics, make an impact worldwide? So thank you for that. And to introduce our final panel and unbelievable panel on water and the oceans and what's going on, I'd like to introduce Kelly Martin, the Director of Operations at the Green Sports Alliance. So much for sticking through this. We're excited to have you here. Um, for those that were here the other night, you may have heard Bill Walton refer to me as a goddess of the night. Um, but by day, I'm actually the, the director of operations for the Green Sports Alliance. Um, so I'm really happy to meet all of you. And for those I haven't met yet, please come say hello. Um, it is my absolute honor right now to introduce the ocean health panel that we've lined up for you today. Um, I'm going to speed through this. Um, you've heard dozens of reasons why the oceans are important. Um, we are in this amazing venue right now, and Dune, the executive director for the Lonely Whale Foundation, I had the pleasure of sharing a drink with her last night, and she made a comment that really stuck with me. Um, she said that we're doing all this great work in these venues and stadiums on land, and we really need to now shift our focus to what makes up 70% of our planet, the water and the oceans. 97% of the Earth's water is found in oceans. And I think it would be wonderful if um, we can take our athletes with all this emphasis of surfing and sailing um, onto the water and let's make an impact and go from land to the sea. Um, so with that, um, I'm just going to make it real brief here. Um, we have Dune Ives, who's with the Lonely Whale Foundation. Um, we also have Mark with Sailors from the Sea. Um, Sailors for the Sea, excuse me. Um, they are one of our Environmental Innovators of the Year award winners. We celebrated them last night, so congratulations on your great work. Um, we have Kevin with Sustainable Surf, and then we also have David who represents CenturyLink Field. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce them to the stage, um, and as you guys walk up, 
bear with me. We have a small crowd, but another bad joke um, for you. What do sports fans and the ocean have in common? We wave. So if you could bear with me to get you guys excited and going, we're going to do a quick wave here as they come on the stage. <laughs> um, so let's start to my right, and we're going to move this way, and it's, it's going to be enthusiastic, small but enthusiastic, okay? <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the Lonely Whale Foundation will be streaming this panel live on their Facebook page. We'll be taking questions via Facebook and at the end from audience members. Um, you'll see the volunteers with the flashcards. Um, please write them around and we may have prizes for people that ask questions. So thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Hey, hey, how is everyone? Are you awake? Amazing speakers. JT's not awake, that's not uncommon. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, so my panelists are coming up, thank you. Sit as far away from me as you possibly can, that would be amazing. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, thank you, Mark. So just to let everybody know, this presentation is being streamed live on Facebook on the Lonely Whale Foundation page. So if you are online, you can go there, you can actually submit questions there as well and we'll answer questions from the audience as well as from those who are submitting via Twitter and Facebook. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. So as one of the original founding members of the Green Sports Alliance back in 2009, 2010, I actually couldn't be more proud of the work the organization has done. Over 380 members globally, including 181 teams and then 160 venues, I believe the number is, um, and the work that the organizations have done individually and collectively on behalf of the environment is really unsurpassed. We don't see this in corporate America. We don't see this in other walks of our life. The power of sports and entertainment venues to really chase, change the face of our planet is, is something that we should all be really excited about. So my ask of you, and the reason why we assembled this panel, is to be thinking about how you can turn from green to blue. How do you blue operations? A lot of you already focus on that already with your work with greenhouse gas emissions reduction, and we need more of that. We know that the coral reef bleaching that we're seeing in the Great Barrier Reef is even worse than we ever imagined. I can't actually tell you you have to see it firsthand to really understand the impact that has on one of the most important sources of protein that we have today, and that's our fish species. Fish rely on healthy coral reef for fish nurseries. And without that, it's very difficult to continue to provide the number one source of protein for the vast majority of the world's growing population. So we have a lot of ocean health issues. I'm not gonna dwell on them, but I do wanna give you a couple of really interesting stats that you should take with you. Annually, it's estimated there are 300 million metric tons of new plastic produced. 300 million metric tons of new plastic produced annually. Only 10% of that is recycled. So where does it go? We know a lot of it actually ends in the water. 86 million metric tons are estimated to be in the water today with 8 million new tons entering the waterways every single year. That plastic is getting into the bellies of whales, it's being ingested by fish. It's really creating an unhealthy marine ecosystem. Just today, The Guardian reported that there are one million plastic bottles bought around the world every single minute. If only 10% of what we produce is recycled, where are those one million water bottles every single minute going? They're really going into our waterways and they're causing a lot of devastation. So now really is the time to act. But these stats are not motivating, are they? I mean, you, are you like super excited to jump up and start saving the planet right now? They're really daunting, I know JT is. <laughs> They're really daunting stats. And so we have to really think about how do we change the face of our ocean's environment and make it easy and make it fun at the same time because when we hear stats like in the United States alone, we use 500 million plastic straws every single day. Do you know 500 million plastic straws 
are enough to fill, give me one second, I gotta get to my stat because it's crazy, to fill Yankee Stadium nine times every year. That's just in the US. So at Lonely Well Foundation, one of the things we're focused on is to bring a little bit of levity to the issue. So the way that we engage people around a healthy ocean is something we call stop sucking. And can you cue the video? Pretty fun, isn't it? So we call this sucker punch. We took an octopus tentacle to South by Southwest and we sucker punched everybody who came through the Mashable House, including Neil deGrasse Tyson. We got De La Soul a couple of days later with the Rachel Ray activation. It's resulted in pledges all around the world to refuse right around 100 million straws. And that was just in a couple of weeks of activation. So by having fun, by integrating ocean health conversations into places that we normally go, we can actually make an impact. So I'm really excited about that campaign. What I'm also really excited about is to share with you the work that these three gentlemen up here on stage have been doing to address ocean health. And what I did is I assembled a very interesting panel of surfing in the middle, which I'm so glad PT was here to talk with us about the potential for surfing to really change the state of our planet. He couldn't be more right. Sailors as well with Mark and the work that you do at Sailors for the Sea, and then bringing it back home to what most of you really experience and understand on a daily basis, and that is a very large sports and entertainment venue of CenturyLink, and the work that David does is part of First and Goal. So each of these gentlemen are gonna share with you a series of slides to tell you their story about how they impact ocean health and are working hard to create a healthy marine environment. And then we're gonna take questions from the audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with Kevin. Kevin, do you wanna come up here? You can give your panel presentation from up here. Um, and as, as uh, Kevin's coming up, just really quick about Kevin. So Kevin is the co-founder of Sustainable Surf. Um, there are a lot of amazing surfing organizations that exist today. PT mentioned another one, Surfrider. And what you're gonna hear from Kevin today is the work that they're doing not only to engage the surfing community, but really to engage the surf industry and really transform from the inside out. So Kevin, thank you. Thanks, dude. Let's make sure this is the right height here. So, pleasure to be here today. All right, so where's my slides? Let's get those going. Run through this really quick. So, Sustainable Surf, we're a nonprofit based in California. Uh, we're six years old now. I was started by myself and my partner, buddy Michael Stewart. He lives in San Francisco. I live in Manhattan Beach in LA. And I titled this, Can Surfers Stop Global Warming? I know that's not the PC way to talk about climate change, but actually, Climate change is a symptom of the fact that the Earth is warming up really fast. And that is what actually threatens the oceans. And you know, in case the people here in the stadiums are, aren't too worried about the oceans, that's where 70% of our oxygen comes from every year. And 85% of the rain that we use to get fresh water. And it's the most dominant force on the planet. So we need to worry about what's happening to the oceans. And my background is an Earth scientist, geologist, physicist, and done a lot of work in climate change and Michael and I started Sustainable Surf as a way to bring unique uh, solutions to this issue. And I'm gonna get in my soapbox a little bit at the platform in the pulpit here to tell you about what we really need to get solutions for these, this major, major issue. So, next slide. So how big is this problem, right? So I think it's fitting we have Greg Long surfing a 40-foot wave <laughs> that breaks in about five feet of water, so he better not fall. There's a big a lot of air under his board, but he made that wave. That was pretty gnarly. He's one of our ambassadors and one of the best big wave surfers in the world. And this is 
if you were to be suddenly, you and I were transported into his spot, that's kind of how big the problem is, right? So, all right, so, so what's happening? I mean, so sea level rise is a big issue, like about 40% of the people live within uh, two, two meters of the ocean, or in terms of elevation, and it's happening much faster than the models predict. I mean, I'm a glaciologist, geologist, and all the models and scientists who are predicting sea level rise, uh, they know that their model is under-predictive because it's a nonlinear process and it's really hard to predict something nonlinear. So that's actually a much bigger problem than scientists are really letting on. The policy planners know that, but it's hard to deal with. Ocean acidification is even crazier because humans are emitting CO2 fat, like about a thousand times faster than it's ever happened in the history of the geologic history of the Earth. And that's making the oceans acidify 10 times faster than they ever have in the history of the Earth. And coral reefs will be the first major ocean ecosystem to go extinct, some say by 2050. Uh, it's really hard to predict that, but you know, those, are, those are the rainforests of the sea. And so much of ocean's life comes from coral reef ecosystems. Great Barrier Reef, I was reading the news yesterday, about half the Great Barrier Reef has died in the last two years due to ocean bleaching, coral bleaching. So pretty serious stuff. And uh, a report just came out today uh, basically saying that we have three years, like the year 2020, to actually produce CO2 re emission reductions to really start solving this problem. So, I mean, think about that. But that's not what scares me. What scares me is this one, and the next one even more. But this one is about, you don't even hear about this because people are still, still trying to figure out if it's really happening or not. That's the level of discourse, right? But ocean circulation change is the big one because oceans basically move up and down. Like There's currents that go all throughout the oceans. They bring nutrients from, down, from the deep ocean and they bring oxygen from the upper ocean down to the deep ocean. When that changes, uh, plankton don't get nutrients, and then the plankton die. That's what produces the oxygen, by the way, and all the food in the ocean. And they're already showing a 30% decline in plankton in much of the world's oceans due to the warming of the oceans, which reduces circulation. That's actually a pretty big problem. And then ultimately, this is what the real issue is. It's that there's all these tipping points that means that even if we stopped emitting CO2 today, like all humans said, okay, so today, that's it, we're done. Global warming would still continue unabated because of all these tipping points that are being activated as we speak. So to actually solve the problem of climate change and global warming, here's what needs to happen. So I, I was stoked when Jason put that slide up because I thought it really encapsulated what's going on. Like on the left side, we've got things that basically cause emissions, and as you move from the far left to the center, you're reducing emissions. So like this arena, which is awesome, you know, has the solar panels on the roof, so it's not, it's not using any excess energy, it means they're getting close to the zero point of that graph. But if we're gonna solve climate change, we've gotta find solutions that go to the far point of the graph, the green, because that's where CO2 is being taken out of the atmosphere. And so what we need to do is, as a society, figure out how do we take CO2 out much faster than we have done in the past. And this is how we're going to do it, right? So how do we solve this? Fundamentally, it comes down to the story of how we relate to the natural world. You know, like a, there's a dichotomy that we have in our Western culture about humans are separate from nature. And that itself is a symptom or one of the root drivers of the problems, right? But there's other cultures that are different. Surfing is one of them. And so here's the solutions that we're implementing in sustainable surf. I'm gonna tell you what they are and then we'll get into the details a little bit later. But first, that story has to be fun. Like, <laughs> how many times have you heard about climate change and says, oh yeah, dude, that's great, let's get on it. That'll be fun to solve, I'm, I'm there, right? It's usually a really scary thing. You're like, oh God, okay, well, if I don't eat you know, dinner there, I don't drive my car and maybe I'll save the polar bears. And this, the messaging is all wrong. So we need to use positive messaging and not just about fun, but actually the solutions save money, they improve our quality of life. It's actually good for us. And then we change the narrative, reframe the debate. That's what needs to happen, right? And the cool thing about surfing in this, in this whole thing is that people love to hear stories about surfing. It's the number one sport that kids want to learn in America more than any other sport. And so stories that start with surfing bring the fun right from the start. And then you can talk about the other issues that matter. And you've got people's attention from the start. So that's actually a pretty cool fact. It has to be authentic, too. So so like this is Michelle Brez winning the Pipe Masters at the biggest surf contest of the year last December, riding an eco board. So we have two eco boards on, on stage here, boards made with recycled styrofoam from coolers and plant-based resins, resins that don't use petroleum as much. And then that board on the far right is using recycled, reclaimed uh, FSC certified polonia wood. 
right? So <laughs> these are like ultra high tech sustainable uh, sports equipment. And so these companies and these surfers, highest level are using it, they're actually living the story of sustainability and proving that it works. Because in the beginning, all boards were eco boards, right? We saw this graph of Duke's slide, and it's, uh, I, I love this, this photo. I mean, this is a beautiful shot of a board that was, basically when they cut the, the trees down to make surfboards, they would do rituals to thank you know, nature for giving them this wood to make a board, and then when the board broke, they just let it wash away and it would decompose. So now we're trying to figure out how to make boards that are high performance that can meet that, and it's actually happening. And, and here's the, the great thing about surfing is that the culture of ancient Hawaii, which is perhaps the most sustainable culture in the history of humanity, is a thousand years old. It's older than Western culture. And they had a very deep connection to nature and very advanced ideas like this ahupua'a is their watershed management, which, is, which beats the pants off of anything in Portland or Seattle or elsewhere, right? It's, a, it's really advanced and holistic about humans are stewards of nature and enhance nature at every level, from the top of the highest peak out to the end of the furthest reef, both for their own benefit, but for everything else that lives. And that's what we need to actually start rolling back CO2 emissions. And then we need the positive role models. Like, who, who are the people you can point to in, in your experience that are like, oh, I could live like them and have a lower carbon footprint, and that would be great. And there's no one there. Like, we don't have those role models. So we need to find them. And I think that pro surfers, like Rob Machado, one of our ambassadors, like, they call him the most stylish surfer alive. Uh, those are the guys that can show how to live a low-carbon lifestyle that's fun and desirable. And that's also what is really needed. That's one of the main barriers to the transformation that needs to happen. So, and surfers like Kelly Slater, Greg Long, uh, Tom Curran, Jack Johnson up there. Like, Jack Johnson has a, a farm outside of his recording studio. And he actually picks his own salad for lunch when he's recording music. <laughs> you know, like, these are the role models that we can use to show what it means to live a, you know, what we call a deep blue life. And then our, so get a little details on our, my company. So our mission is to be a catalyst. We're a nonprofit with three people, and we create the stories that then gets everybody engaged to see their authentic role. And do I have time to play the video, or it's a two and a half minute video? Or should we move along? Okay, so we won't play the video. Unfortunately, my partner, Michael Stewart, is t talking about sustainable surf, but you can go on our website and learn a lot more about our programs, and maybe I'll get that into the, uh, into the questions as well. So that's it for me. Thank you. I think, is this on? Is that on? Is on? No, it's not on. I don't know how to turn this on. Uh, so I think PT really highlighted it best that surfers are on the front lines. You know, they see the plastic, they actually surf through the waste on these incredible breaks all around the world. They see it on the beach. There's a phenomenal organization in the UK called Surfers Against Sewage. Can you only imagine what they do, <laughs> what they're focused on? So they really see this front line every single day. And so the stories coming from the surfing industry about the state of the ocean environment are the real stories that are so important for us to be paying attention to. And we know that when the surfers are happy, when your breaks are still there, trestles doesn't go away. When you can surf in a clean environment, then we've done an amazing job. So let's, we'll uh, hear a little bit more from Kevin later. On the, also on the water, but on top of the water are the sailors. And as I've come to know sailors for the sea and the sailing community, which is not a community that I personally grew up with, I have come to recognize sailors are kind of a crazy bunch. There really isn't anything that they won't do. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, and there's also a phenomenal opportunity to really, really grab the attention of this legacy sport, something that's really a part of their families, their culture, their history, their communities, and pass down from generation to generation the importance of keeping this big, beautiful body of water healthy. So I mean, without further ado, I'd love to have Mark Davis come up here, who is the head of, he's the president of Sailors for the Sea. We've known each other for about three, four years now, I think it is, uh, to come up and share with us his story of Sailors for the Sea. I'm glad to see so many dedicated GSAers still here hanging in to the bitter end of the game today. It, uh, so thank you for all, and thank you, Dune, for that introduction, and, and Kevin, for that wonderful overview. We, as an organization, exist pretty much for the same reason that surfers do. It's, they're our brethren on the water. And um, 
Let's see here. So we have our first slide. Move it forward here. So we define Sailor as a traveler by water, and we feel this is very important as we're a global organization with uh, affiliate offices in Portugal, Japan, Chile. And our mission is really to unite the sailing community to protect the ocean and create one of the most powerful conservation movements of our, of our time. Um, our whole message is based on hope and personal action. Um, the information about the, the stresses on the ocean today can really be quite gloomy and very depressing. So we try to instill hope and give people the opportunity to understand how each decision they make in their daily lives really will make a difference in the health of the ocean. Now, as a data-driven organization, we like to know what our sailors are thinking. And uh, as you can see here uh, this, uh, from this slide, sailors overwhelmingly can see the, the damage that's being caused, the degradation, and they really do care about it. But what do they care about? So these issues are the key ones that come to mind over and over and over again when we do our research. So all of these issues that sailors care about are man-made and are solvable in our lifetime with current innovative technologies and here again, personal action. Having your own shopping bags instead of going for the plastic shopping bags, those kinds of things. Really what we serve is, uh, to our community is as an uh, aggregator of information and an interpreter of complex ocean health issues, regulatory issues, and what it does it mean to me as a sailor. So, our signature program is called Clean Regattas, and it's a wonderful program used around the world. Uh, it's a hybrid program based on the uh, ISO 20121 standard for event sustainability management, the ISO 14000 standard for environmental management, and the Global, Global Reporting Index event organizers sustainability guidelines. And it's 25 best practices. Each best practice has three key performance indicators. And it's a grade A system starting at the bronze level all the way up to the platinum. It is a self-certifying program, except at the platinum level, where they are required to have an outside uh, evaluation team uh, work with them. Now, as part of our message platform to the sailing community, we like to have a lot of fun. And they're very sports-oriented people. So they not only sail, but they play tennis, they play golf, they enjoy arena sports and the like. So this is one way that we reach out to them in this next video. It's no secret that athletes hold themselves to incredibly high standards. When they're at the top of their game, they expect conditions to be perfect. Be ridiculous to expect anything less. If something needs to be pure to perform, why would we put garbage in it? Every year, 8 million metric tons of plastic enters the ocean. That's enough plastic to cover every coastline on Earth. Tennis players and golfers wouldn't put up with trash on their playing field, so why do we? Join the race to restore ocean health at sailorsforthesea.org. It's going to take a really big crew to fix this mess. As you can imagine, the uh, owners of the golf course and the tennis courts were a little upset with us when we started throwing trash all over the place, but we did pick it all up at the same time. So there are over 12 million registered sailors in the world today. In 2016, we served 1.3 million of that population, engaged them through our programs. We have a marine education program for children as well as adults. We publish a green boating guide, and we have a very robust social media platform that uh, works in tandem with groups like Lonely Whale Foundation to amplify the message, because it's really a common message about protecting the Earth. Now, we know we're going to succeed because we still have a long way to go to, uh, to reach all 12 million registered sailboaters in the world. Uh, but we know that protecting the ocean is so important to the health of us, our children, our future grandchildren. And we want a vibrant ocean that really will work for everyone. Thank you.
was another really good example of having a little bit of fun with a really big issue. Of course, nobody wants to fall in the tennis court like I do, because my two left feet, and fall into a pile of trash. Um, so, the, you know, I think Kevin mentioned earlier the, the, the Earth's surface, the vast majority of the Earth's surface is covered by water, about 70%. And when you think about the impact of, of really having those who are on the water and in the water engaged, it feels like a, you know, it feels like a big group of people. But for the vast majority of us, the ocean is completely unattainable. It takes money. It takes knowing how to swim. It takes having access to a boat or a surfboard. Having somebody with you that's safe and responsible who can help ensure that you have a really safe experience. Most of us will never dive. Most of us will never surf. Most of us will never sail. There are a lot of us around the world, though, that are connected to the ocean. Every single one of us is connected to the ocean. Every second breath that we take comes from the ocean. I'm just going to pause on that for a second. Every second breath that we take. So, that one's compliment of trees. <gasps> that one's the compliment of the ocean. If we're gonna take every second breath from the ocean, we have to have a healthy ocean. So that means we need to connect to landlocked individuals and communities and venues that can also help us to create a healthy ocean. It's not just about what the surfers and the sailors are gonna do. It's actually also about what the Seahawks are gonna do and the Sounders that play at CenturyLink and all the other sports teams around the world that are really engaged in connecting to individuals on a daily basis, including suppliers and vendors. So I'd love to have David Young come up and speak with us right now. David is the uh, general manager of CenturyLink Field. Prior to being at CenturyLink, he was the vice president of stadium operations for Kansas City Chiefs, and also did a stint at Disney, which we have to talk about at some point, because there are those underground tunnels, right? That only you people who work there know where they are and how to access them. Right. Yeah, we should, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> So please welcome David to talk with us about how CenturyLink is really tackling ocean health as well. Thank you. Uh, one of my first jobs was actually giving tours of those tunnels oh. at Walt Disney World. Yeah, and riding rides. I got paid to ride rides, which was a lot of fun now. Uh, not as much fun, though, as uh, talking about CenturyLink Field and the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, we're really pleased to be here, and uh, as founding members, the Seahawks and CenturyLink Field of the Green Sports Alliance couldn't be more pleased to be here with you guys today, uh, and thanks, Dune, for inviting us out to, uh, to talk to you. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, who we are, what we do at CenturyLink Field, and uh, kind of our story, our green story, and uh, now how we're expanding from green into, in, into more blue and ocean health. So uh, CenturyLink Field, that's it right there. You can see downtown Seattle, uh, home of the Seattle Seahawks. We also host the Seattle Sounders, the MLS Cup champions uh, for the previous season. Uh, you can also see that little bit, well, I guess you're looking up there. You can see that little sliver of Elliott Bay. So we're pretty close to the water, a couple hundred yards away from salt water that empties right out into the Pacific Ocean. So obviously ocean health is very important to us. Uh, well, go back. We do a lot more than just uh, Seahawks and Sounders events uh, at CenturyLink Field. In fact, uh, if you look at our overall event calendar, that's maybe 10% of uh, the dates on our calendar. We, uh, we host about 2.4 million people, 185 events a year at our three venues. We've got CenturyLink Field, which is the stadium, 69,000 uh, capacity football and soccer stadium. Uh, we also have CenturyLink Field Event Center. It's a half million square foot uh, event and meeting facility. It's the largest of its kind in the area, uh, in, in the state of Washington. Uh, and then we've also got the WAMU Theater, which is a uh, 7,000 capacity music venue uh, out in the event center as well. So between all of those uh, three venues, like I said, we do about 185 events a year. That's a lot of food. That's a lot of waste. We also have three, I'm sorry, four off-site locations uh, that we operate, pro shops and a warehouse and a distribution center. Um, 
we uh, have on uh, we have taken our food and beverage service in house uh, this year with first and goal hospitality so that affords us uh, some more options in terms of uh, what we can do with sustainability on the food front so just taking you through some of our green program here, uh, sustainability has always been important to us. Uh, we, you know, by virtue of where we are in Seattle here on the West Coast, it is something that is uh, ingrained in the community uh, and almost expected. Uh, so our story goes back to 2006 when we first started measuring our uh, waste diversion for the first time and noticed that we were well under 5%. Uh, 3.66% in fact, uh, for our waste diversion and uh, figured we could do a heck of a lot better. Um, going back even before that, the Kingdom sat on the site of where CenturyLink Field is uh, today and that was imploded in uh, 1999 and uh, most of the cement and concrete, I, I should say, uh, that was used, that was built, that used to build the Kingdom was recycled and about 35% of that went into CenturyLink Field itself. So through various tactics over the years, over the last 10 years, we've been able to achieve about a 96% diversion rate, um, doing that through uh, waste diversion, through uh, recycling, but also composting, sourcing all of our concessions materials, um, boats, cups, as compostable materials. We, in fact, uh, deploy very few traditional trash receptacles in the facility. Uh, you will be very, it'll be very hard for you to find one inside CenturyLink Field. We have recycle bins, we have compost, uh, and we make it very easy for our fans. You just throw your stuff into the recycle or the compost bins. You don't have to worry about sorting it, really. Uh, our waste diversion rate for 2016 was actually 97.5%. Um, we've plateaued since 2013. Um, don't know how we can get quite higher than that, but uh, we continue to try. Um, so we look at um, what we've done in, in three ways, really four ways that I'll talk about later, but three primary ways. So waste diversion was the first uh, kind of low-hanging fruit, uh, pretty simple, one that you always think about, recycling, composting. Uh, then we turned towards uh, resource, energy, and water conservation. Uh, we implemented some uh, low-flow uh, water fixtures throughout the facility, um, also through um, LED lighting and uh, other energy conservation measures. We reduced our, our uh, energy consumption by about 25%. Uh, we reduced our water consumption um, by such a magnitude that we could give two gallons of water to every single person that attends a Seahawks game throughout the year as they exit the building. Uh, that's how much water we, we reduced our consumption by. So we, we got a good handle on our energy and water conservation. I should also mention we have a uh, solar array up on our event center, which seems a little counterintuitive for Seattle, right? We don't get a lot of sun up there. Um, but in fact, that solar array generates about 25% of the energy that we use annually at CenturyLink Field. Next, we moved into food sustainability, and this is uh, something that uh, I hold very dear and I feel very important to myself, but um, you know, once we got a handle on uh, resources and, and recycling, what can we do for the environment? I think we all know that uh, you know, animals, and, and uh, particularly cows and cattle, cause uh, great impact if they're not uh, farmed and raised sustainably. Um, and uh, like we're talking about here today, there's an impact on the sea as well. So we were uh, the first stadium to be Smart Catch certified. Uh, which means that 90%, at least 90% at CenturyLink Field, it's 95% of all of our seafood is sustainably uh, uh, harvested from the sea. Uh, we also focus on local, so we go out to local vendors and uh, seafood uh, vendors uh, in the Seattle area, and uh, they know that what we are looking for is Smart Catch certified, so they steer us towards that. Uh, occasionally it's more expensive, um, occasionally it's a lot more expensive. Uh, salmon can be up to uh, two times the cost of farm-raised salmon if you're looking to source that sustainably. Um, you know, shrimp is two or three dollars a pound more expensive um, when it's sourced sustainably, occasionally. Um, but we feel it's still the right thing to do. Uh, we've also uh, come full circle on our composting program. We have a great partner locally, uh, Cedar Grove uh, Composting, that's been taking away our compost for about five or six years now. Uh, they recently started a farm out in Bothell, uh, between Bothell and Woodenville uh, in the Seattle area, and uh, our compost goes to that farm along with compost from other areas and facilities, and uh, it's used to then grow uh, vegetables and then we purchase those vegetables back. So it's kind of the uh, circle of life. Recently they planted, uh, uh, we had them plant a couple acres of potatoes and uh, for a Seahawks game this fall, all of our fries and all of our potato products at the facility will be uh, fully sustainable from that farm and uh, fed by compost from CenturyLink Field. 
Uh, in addition to that, and, and you know, like I said, we are very close to the water. Um, a lot of our cleaning products can get into the water stream, which dumps right and could dump into Puget Sound. Um, so we've made some efforts to go, um, in some cases, uh, chemical free in our cleaning using ionized water. Uh, in others, we have been able to source uh, Green Seal certified uh, cleaning products that uh, are not only green, but also have a uh, lower ratio of uh, dilution so that you're using less product, less product that's going to get into the waste stream, less product that's going to get into the ocean. Uh, and then also you're using less plastic because you're using less product, there's less bottles to be recycled as well. So that's a little bit about where we've come from and uh, where we're going. Great. Thank you. Sure. Does this, oh, it, does, it is on. Amazing. Um, so I, we're going to go into a little bit of Q&A. And I will to let you know that we have some tchotchke. We have some t-shirts for those who are awake and brave enough and fired up. And you want to get all your ocean health questions answered by these three gentlemen up here. Um, I tried really, really hard, and thank you to everybody who was patient with my ridiculous question over an email of, could I get my hand on one of those t-shirt cannons and just fire them into the audience, because I thought that would be amazing. Turns out it's not that easy. <laughs> They're made of plastic. It's okay, it's all right. It's not gonna get into the waterway. <laughs> so no t-shirt cannon, but we have some lovely people who are gonna be handing out t-shirts. Um, so just one more stat to share with you when we go into questions at our current rate of consumption of plastic. So remember that 300 million produced annually number and the one million plastic bottles purchased every minute? At our current rate of plastic, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation predicts that by the, the year 2050, we will have more plastic than fish in the water by volume. It's kind of disgusting and it's really unnecessary. So I really applaud you guys in the work that you're doing to really educate your operations and to take that step forward to not only address plastic, but also to address farming practices, which is a great, I can't wait to eat the french fries at CenturyLink filled. Yeah. <laughs> um, and really educate larger communities. So I'm curious, as we source questions and there are questions hopefully coming in through Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, but I'm, I, Kevin, I'd really love to hear you talk a little bit about What's the impact of your Deep Blue Living program and the work that you do through these beautiful eco boards to, to really transform the industry? What has been the response from the surfing community? Can you talk with us a little bit about that? Because I think people all assume that all surfers are created equal, everyone's an environmentalist, they're already on board, but can you share with us your experience? Sure. Well, first thing is uh, surfers, I think, have perhaps the most latent potential to become truly authentic and living an ocean-friendly, deep blue life. But it's hard for surfers just like anyone else. I mean, the actions that you need to take are tough. And for companies themselves, they've got to stay financially sustainable first. And the question is, can they do that while also doing what they know they, they love, which is protecting the ocean? So what we found is that there's certain companies that are ready to jump right in. Some have to take, take a little bit of time, and some aren't there yet. But for example, these two companies, Channel Island Surfboards and Firewire Surfboards, the top one and two surfboard companies in the world, they're making more and more sustainable boards. They got their, their um, Firewires 100%, Channel Islands is making more and more every single year, and they got their pros riding them. And then they're communicating to all of their fans and followers about what's happening. And then all the pro surfers are telling their fans and followers about riding sustainable boards. And that is really starting to have a, a I guess you could call it a uh, exponential impact. And that's kind of the point. We want to show that people who are ready for it, who have the impact on the followers, so we're helping them figure it out. And it's, it's going quite well. Awesome. Hey, PT, for China, we should get a, an eco an eco friendly um, surfboard sponsor. <laughs> uh, Smart Catch. So uh, is Keith in the audience? Hey, thank you. So Keith up there is from the James Beard Foundation, and James Beard Foundation runs the Smart Catch program, um, which is a program that was started by Mr. Paul Allen, who is the owner of the Seahawks as well as the Trailblazers. I'm um, really out of his passion for making sure that he knew when he went into a restaurant what was sustainable and what wasn't on the menu. Because not all fish are created equal, including not all sustainable fish. But can you talk with me a little bit about, David, the decision that you guys went through at CenturyLink to become Smart Catch certified? And I know you talked a little bit about the price difference. It is more expensive in some cases, and that can be a little difficult to kind of 
overcome. But why, why Smart Catch? Why did you take that next step? And what do you feel like the kind of the impact is that you can say you've been able to have as a stadium? Well, the easy answer is the owner said to do it, right? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, but in, in fact, that's a big component. It is, uh, you know, it's in any of these programs in our facilities, it's all about the people and having the right people to implement the programs, having the right people behind them from top to bottom that endorse them. And so having an owner like Paul Allen, who is very passionate about conservation and, and uh, sustainability in general, whether it's in Africa with his census of, for elephants or uh, with the acidification of the oceans or with Smart Catch, uh, it, it's just great to be able to then have those resources to be able to go out and do it. Uh, and it's just the right thing to do. You know, in Seattle, I showed you on that, on that photo, we're, you know, 100 yards or so away from saltwater. And uh, so for us uh, in the city, food and, or I'm sorry, ocean sustainability is, is a huge issue for us. And uh, so much of our economy originally and continues to be based on uh, the sea. Uh, so. It is more expensive to us. Um, we may or may not pass on some of that cost, um, but we all know that margins on uh, concessions food is, uh, could, we could probably take a little bit of a, a hit with product cost on that. Um, but it's just the right thing to do, you know? Um, and if we're going to have a 97% diversion rate on our uh, waste stream, if we are going to have solar panels in Seattle, if we are going to, you know, reduce our water flow, uh, but then serve farm-raised fish, serve shrimp that were caught, you know, in, in a not sustainable way. It, it just makes all the rest of it disingenuous. So we really have to close the loop there on all of our practices. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. Um, and I also want to point out that CenturyLink Field is moving away from single-use plastic straws, compostable straws, and towards paper straws, marine gradable straws. And I yes. think that's a really nice connection point, too, to the sustainable seafood. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are in the process of uh, working with the Lonely Whale Foundation and Dune to uh, move away from our compostable straws, uh, which we thought were, were great, and they certainly are. Um, but uh, yeah, moving on to those, uh, the paper straws and the ones that can be ocean degradable, and we will do that this, this football season. Very exciting. Great. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, and then sailors. So sailors. Um, so you built up this incredible program. You have a certification scheme. Certainly, as we look across the sailing community, we've got Volvo in the ocean race. We've got Land Rover BAR. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the reach of the sailing community is global, and, and now they're tied to the UN Clean Seas Initiative as well. What are you seeing from the sailing community as you have this conversation with sailors? How far are they willing to go to help protect the ocean and create a healthy marine environment? We're finding that the uh, sailors are really stepping up to the plate in big ways. Um, Antigua Race Week has been part of our Clean Regattas program for a number of years, and uh, they've been to the gold level. And this year, they banned all straws in the three marinas where the race was being held. But knowing that these uh, sailors are going to be out in the community, the organizers went and talked to all the bars and restaurants uh, near the marinas and got them to ban plastic straws, straws also. And it was such a huge success actually saved them money by not putting out so many plastic straws, uh, that it was adopted by the um, Antigua Hospitality uh, Association. So it really, we have created a wave of change on an island that has open dumps because they can't dispose of their waste fast enough. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that just washes into the ocean. And of course, we don't go to the Caribbean islands and for trash. We want to go see beautiful coral and beautiful fish and beautiful waves and those kinds of things. I recently snorkeled in Bali through trash to get to the mantas, to be able to snorkel with the mantas. An hour off the coast, there was a trash line that went all the way down the water column. And I had a, a couple of friends with me, and one of them actually got stuck trying to get back to the boat, and we had to go rescue her because there was so much plastic to swim through. So you're right, you know, we have this idea of what the island nations could look like, right? In our mind, they're beautiful, they're pristine beaches, and they're not, and it's really those developing countries that are, are really being hit hardest by our consumption, not only in the developing world, but in the developed world. Do I have time for a couple of questions? One, two, yes? A couple, okay. T-shirt, there's a t-shirt winner right there. The 
so the question is, you know, across the entire supply chain, everybody has a responsibility. And certainly it doesn't all fall on consumers and it doesn't all fall on, you know, the surfers and sailors and sports fans and operations teams. Where is the responsibility on the producer side? Um, and I'll just quickly, there's, there's a growing movement on the marine litter side, and I think there's a growing movement too on the seafood side. So there's, there's a lot of hope spots, there's a lot of positive actions being taken, um, but what we need is we need this market pressure too. We need these examples and more examples of leaders within these industries to really show producers, to show the market what the expectations are, as well as policymakers. Do you guys have anything to add on that? Sure. Um, just last week, the American Chemistry Society, which is not known for being eco-friendly, held a marine debris summit in Newport, Rhode Island, which is where we're based, uh, in conjunction with the Ocean Conservancy. And they brought in key players from uh, all the major industries, and they really were trying to develop solutions. And I think we need to look to companies to develop our, our solutions, because they have the research budgets, they have the production capacity, and, and they know that they need to do better. Uh, so we're seeing a, a, a nice trend in working with companies saying, all right, how can we reduce our carbon footprint? Is our product going to have a full life cycle? Those kinds of things. to showcase uh, the farm to table at the stadium level. Uh, I, I live in the East Bay, and of course, everybody's familiar with Chez Panisse, uh, which started the farm to table. So, and I own a snack food company, so I uh, am immersed in food every day. So it is so exciting and inspirational. How can you uh, be an influence across your league and other professional sports so that they can take the steps to close that circle. We've heard a lot this weekend about, of course, waste management, but when we start in the procurement chain, then the waste management can take care of itself, as is evident at your stadium. Yeah, I think it's in uh, venues like this and in uh, other networking events. And, you know, one, it takes just a few people to go out and start doing something like this. And, and uh, it, frankly, it's kind of fun, actually, you know? Um, that I showed a picture up there. I, we visited the farm. That was a picture of myself and my executive chef and uh, the head of our food and beverage operation uh, out at the farm. And it's just fun. I mean, we kind of own a plot of land and we grow food on this farm and you know the waste goes there and we grow it and chef michael is so passionate about it he goes out and sources uh you know sustainable land-based proteins as well we've got ranches across uh, washington and oregon that we work with for you know their sustainable practices on pork and the beef front as well um so it's it 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 is a little more work, um, and I think that it's just having this template now that others can uh, adopt, uh, and just having people that are passionate about it in your organization is, is, is it'll be a very, I don't see why others can't adopt it. Great, so we're getting the hook. I think we can probably talk about this for a lot longer this afternoon, and we have more t-shirts, so if you want a Sucker Punch t-shirt, please come up and get one, because I don't want to take them home with me, so I'm gonna leave them here for everyone, and we also have paper straws from Aardvark up here too, so take those as well. Um, I just wanna thank the panelists, if we can give them a round of applause for their hard work and their commitment in this space. And we'll make sure that the video from Sustainable Surf is available and, and so you can view that and learn a little bit more about what the organization does. Um, so we're gonna be uh, consolidating some case studies across venues and across sports over the course of the next several months and then producing those and providing those out to the industry so that everybody can really figure out how to shift from green to blue and really dive much deeper into the questions and the conversation around sustainability. So thanks to the Green Sports Alliance for having us. This is a great talk. Let's do more of this. Thank you, Dune. Thank you, panelists. Are we on? There we go. Thank you, Dune, and thank you, panelists. All right. We still have people in the house. Thank you for hanging with us. <clears throat> you know, this has been a year of firsts uh, for the 2017 summit. It was our first golf invitational, our first youth summit, first collegiate summit with the Pac-12, first national anthem, first time hosted in a lead platinum building, first eco fashion show, and first time actually inviting individual fans to join. We got 30 new members yesterday at the Green Sports Alliance. So it's at once new and, and yet it's the same. 
right? We, we do this in order that you can hopefully learn something, share something that you already know, network, and take away maybe one thing that you can operationalize and, and maybe meet one new contact that you can do work with for next year. So the theme of engaging fans, athletes, and communities, we just want to encourage you to tell your stories, okay? And as we leave, thank you to all of the attendees. Thank you to all of our speakers, our volunteers, the staff on site. Thank you to our presenting sponsor here, Sacramento Kings and Golden One Center. And thanks for your cooperation using the TerraCycle Zero Waste Boxes. And thanks for our generous support of BEF for offsetting our environmental impact. So we'll be sending you a survey. We'll be asking you what you thought. And we really want your feedback, because every year it's our goal to make this better. So now I'd like to welcome back to the stage for one final word, our executive director, Justin Zellner. Thank you, Joe. And I'm going to be very brief. But I'm going to kind of bring this back full circle. So I'm humbled by what happened again when we convened everybody for our annual summit. Three things. We've amped up and shown you how we need to be more interconnective, right? We've engaged with more people and brought out more pioneers, the youth, collegiate, and all of us. We put another defining moment on the planet. We're moving forward, we're increasing our impact, and we're thinking about how sports can lead and I have one action for you, to engage. That's what we need to do. We need to take the opportunity to engage. So all of you thinking about fan and community engagement, and all of you to join us. Take that action, go online, and join us. I thank you very much. We still have a reception to go to, eat a little bit of lunch, enjoy your last remaining times here in Sacramento, and uh, thank you again for another great summit.